Welcome back to What's New With Mead. This is episode 23. I am here today with Jeff Herbert from Superstition Meadery, and I'm uh, super excited to have him here. Um, he is one of the co-owners, if I'm not mistaken, I don't want to say the wrong thing, um, of Superstition. And um, of course, he knows the ins and outs, so we're going to get to learn a lot from him today. Welcome, Jeff. Glad you're here. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So we have uh, communicated over um, email quite a bit, kind of planning this, and I, I sent you a big old list of questions, and um, that's just kind of a, a idea. The big things I want to um, ask you today are just kind of some uh, really questions about how you guys make your meat about at excuse me make your meat at superstition, and uh, I don't want to ask you for recipes. That's not my goal, but just to help enlighten us home brewers. Um, how we can make better meads. So can you tell, for the people who might not know about Superstition, can you tell us about Superstition, what, what you guys are and, and all those things? You bet. So like probably everyone, certainly everyone I've met in the mead industry and just about everyone in the craft brewing industry, I started as a home brewer. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a lot of rabbit hole side stories, but basically a friend of mine came to our house one night for a dinner party and he had some homebrew beers. And my wife and I were always kind of foodies and kind of the people that would go to, you know, what we just called a microbrewery or whatever back in the day right. um, and, and, and enjoyed import beers and things. So I think I was always kind of wired to get into this. I just never was like fully into the scene until I really got into home brewing. And I totally got hooked on the process of making beer and mead. And my first beer I started making came out of a homebrew kit that my wife gave me for Father's Day when I got home from uh, the fire station I worked at in 2009. Mm -hmm. And my kids were really young. And, you know, when you talk about, like you mentioned kids and alcohol, like it just sounds counterintuitive to most people. But yeah, but when you're homebrewing, you've got a six hour day where you're not going anywhere. Right. And you're just you know cleaning stuff, you're making a mess, you're cooking stuff, you're bottling something like later on or whatever. But it turned out to be a really cool activity for me to just hang out and sometimes you know I'd be home brewing into the evening and I had a fire pit in my front yard and I'd have a real cigar my kids would have a bubblegum cigar and you know <laughs> anyways it was just kind of a neat like family activity which and then we led into a family business but I started making mead right away mm -hmm. and so before my first homebrew beer was done fermenting I went to the homebrew store which was in Tempe for me and in you know in the Phoenix area and I said, hey, I want to make a, a Chimay clone because I was into Belgian beers and I want to make a mead. And like, there's just the same story everyone has of being in a Renaissance fair and trying mead. One. I'm, as far as I can remember, I was at the Arizona Renaissance fair once and was like, oh, what's this stuff? And I just kind of knew what it was. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have told you anything about it. But the second I started to make a mead, you have to figure out how to make it. You've got to figure out a recipe. I didn't have any friends that were involved in home brewing at all. I wasn't in a club. So it was just, you know, a couple of books and the internet. And I love doing research, you know, when mm -hmm. it comes to business ideas or, you know, I went to grad school or whatever it is I'm into. I want to know as much about something as I can and really apply myself when I get into it. So I really spent a lot of time learning about all things mead and, and craft beer all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And like every home brewer, I had the dream of, of one day having a brewery or a meadery. And I started to ask the question, what would that look like? And I started to ask questions, you know, learning the business and the etiquette of how do you talk to a brewer or a business owner and try and learn a little bit without being a pain in the ass, you know? And, yeah. and I think I kind of figured that out and started emailing people and telling them right away, hey, I'm interested in doing this and that. Um, would you mind answering a couple of questions? And, you know, you can't just go to someone and say, teach me everything you know. But, to, you know, if you have a couple questions and you respect someone, like if some, someone emailed me the other day, I'm happy to help out. And so I found that there are a lot of people that were happy to help out as well. The biggest thing that really got me going commercially was I took a class at the Siebel Institute in Chicago about how to start a brewery. And I was in the second cohort that ever went through that class. It was only three days, and this sounds ridiculous, but I felt like I got an MBA in three days yeah. because 
you learn how to write a business plan from people who just did it successfully and launched a brewery. Mm -hmm. You learned how to run a brew pub from the manager of the Goose Island brew pub across the street who came over and told you what he does every day. It was an incredible class. You learned about, you know, the rules from a TTB regional guy that came in and talked to everyone. And so I got home from that class and I talked to my wife and said, Hey, I, I think I can write a plan to do this. And my plan could, could have kind of gone two ways, brewery or meadery. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at, you know, where we were living in the Valley at the time and looked at all things in our life and my fire job. And we decided to sell our house and start everything over in Prescott in this cool mountain town, raise our kids out in a kind of rural community. Um, our house backs up to national forests. Like we've got this, you know, like awesome town. It's kind of like Norman Rockwell when mm -hmm. it's not COVID with parades and all this stuff for the holidays and really cool people and an emerging food and craft beverage scene, which was nice. And I was still able to commute to my gig every three days as a firefighter. And so all of these things, just you just take what you have available to you in life and you, and you try and make it work out. And so within a month of moving to Prescott, I took some homebrew meat out to not knowing you're not really supposed to do that or whatever to like a, a winery that was close. Right. And these guys were super cool. It was this older couple. And they, before we were done our visit, they said, Hey, you should make your meat here. And I said, well, that's funny. Cause I was just about to start looking for, you know, a small commercial space to do a nano brewery or a mm -hmm. meadery or something in town. And by then I had written a business plan. I'd figured out the laws. I kind of knew what I had to do. I had an idea of the budget and this turned into a great opportunity. So my wife and I started the, the first alternating proprietorship in Arizona. And that's where one separate licensed winery or, or brewery or distillery uh, rents space from another. So you've got the, the host and the guest in that relationship. Mm -hmm. And I, after about a year of us becoming really good friends with the owners of this winery and, and, and volunteering our time to, you know, to, we did everything but prune vines and, and making wine. And my homebrew skills really helped translate into, you know, cleaning lines and pumps, and sanitation, all the stuff that we always do as homebrewers. And we we're making wine and they agreed to change the license and allow me to apply for my own. And so we did that. And in 2012, um, I started my business commercially and we had 18 square feet of our legal space. We had enough space for two barrel racks stacked up. That was it. Wow. And in 2012, we made 300 gallons of product. Oh By 2017 and two expansions and two SBO, SBA loans later, we had made 29,000 gallons of product and became the biggest winery in the history of our state. And I just actually got a unanimous vote at our city council. I'm looking because I can see city hall right through my window. Uh -huh. Our our local city hall just voted to approve and soon the state will, will follow suit. Nine brand new alternating proprietorships owned by my wife and I that will be sort of related to uh, superstition meadery or our cider or our wine in one way or another because we hit this 40,000 gallon production cap where we're going to this year in a couple of weeks. And that's the limitation we faced at our phase as entrepreneurs in our state. At a certain phase in your business, you run into regulatory challenges across many businesses. Yeah. So that's where we're at right now. And the only way forward for us was to have our own separate licensed LLCs, TTB wineries, state wineries. So kind of on this, you know, blurred out board behind me, there's part yeah. of my plan to where starting in January, we will actually have 10 of our own wineries, which will allow us to grow tenfold in the coming years with production. That is incredible. Man, in, in the, I, I find it fascinating. Uh, I hadn't looked up when you guys started. So it's pretty fascinating to me that in eight short years, eight years feels like a long time, but really for, to grow as big as you guys are, that is incredible. Um, and then 18 square feet to start off. Uh, to me, that's pretty inspiring for anybody who wants to do this. Obviously, you don't have to start off with, um, I, I would say in your first year, you know, the 2,500 square foot space it's nice to but clearly you guys have made it with uh with a such a small beginning so i have a question about your 
kind of going backwards about your your first meads you ever made so you said you went and went to the renaissance fair tried some meads did you go home and, and make traditional meads did you go off a recipe you found online what did you do for your first ones so my very first like first several meads happen, happened to all be acer glens or, or maple meads and so interesting i it was Father's Day, so it was June when I got my homebrew kit, and so it was probably the second week in June I started making a meat, and I thought, well, let's do something for Thanksgiving because that's, like, like my wife, like, gets so into Thanksgiving. She's actually, like, a descendant of the pilgrims from mm. Plymouth and stuff, like, and she's from Massachusetts, and so for her and her family, Thanksgiving's always been this huge tradition, and she goes, like, pulls out all the stops, and so I thought it'd be cool to make a maple meat, and I thought, well, that might kind of go with Thanksgiving dinner, and it was my first meads were definitely better than my first beers. And so I kept trying to dial that recipe in as I was getting way into the beer thing. And then as I got into the beer thing and started to learn about how you can use vanilla beans and cacao nibs and all these different fruits to make crazy beers, I started doing that with mead right away. So I started with maple mead, got into vanilla meads right away. And then I started doing, you know, you can only do this at the you know home brewer level like mm -hmm. legally but you know like bourbon soaked oak cubes oh, and yeah. things like that and and i started to think you know what's gonna pair well with the food i like to eat and what are the exciting flavors and what can i not buy but that i can make uh -huh. and i always figured that while i you know i i made you know an ipa and a hefeweizen and all that stuff i always wanted to do two things with with brewing uh the beer side i wanted to try and make a clone of Belgian dark strong ales that I wanted to drink just to save money because it's my favorite <laughs> beer. And the other thing was I wanted to do things that I've never done before that I couldn't buy in the store that maybe no one had ever done before. Mm -hmm. Why not? So what I would do is look at recipes on the beer side. And th I remember there was this magazine I had, and it was called like 250 clones or something. And they, mm -hmm. th they went to all these breweries and brewers and said, Hey, how can we do five gallons of your whatever beer. And so I would look at the beers I liked and then say, okay, here's a great porter recipe. I'm going to put, you know, maple syrup in that, or I'm going to put some oat cubes, or I'm going to just make it my own, take kind of a proven recipe and then add my own twist. And I started doing that with meats. Of course, there's not much in the way of meat recipes. Mm -hmm. So again, taking those cool, like special ingredients or adjuncts that made beers really interesting also made mead really interesting. Yeah, well, that's really interesting to me that you started with an Acer Glen. I don't think I've heard of many people who have made that as their first one. Had you tried one prior to <laughs> to making it? Or it was just a... oh, all right. So this is funny, and I don't even expect you to believe me, especially in this day and age. But when I had made five commercial meads on my own, that was more commercial meads than I'd ever tried. Mm. Like in Arizona, when I started, you could go to total wine and you could find a Chaucer's, a Redstone and, and a Polish meat. And that was it. That's yeah. all I could find in the state. And you know, the different websites now where you get to order meat mm -hmm. shipped to your house, which are awesome. And it's totally helping to change the industry, especially in 2020. Like that didn't exist then. Right. So to try and experience meat, you had to go out and go to a meter. Mm -hmm. And, and so I remember, um, you know, I went to a metery in Vermont and Massachusetts and then, you know, Colorado as I was traveling, but that was like right as I had started, you know? Mm -hmm. And so and I'd only tried a handful of meads ever, which is insane to think I'm going to start a business trying to make something, maybe to make it like really, really good, but I've never even had these commercial examples anyways. But I was that confident in my homebrewing recipe development that I'm like, I think this is really good. Now, of course, when you give your friends gallons and gallons of beer and mead for free they're going to tell you it's good so you keep feeding them but you know i i think that i could tell you know like if someone did like i remember i made a triple once and and i i was a little on the fence and a couple people kind of like were hesitant to be like it's awesome you know and after a few seasons like yeah that's good but sometimes you'd give someone something and they would be like this is awesome you know and yeah. you knew right away like all right i'm on to something but even at siebel the first question they asked to the whole class they said raise your hand if you're an award-winning home brewer. That was how they started everything. And 39 people out of 40 raised their hand, everyone but me. And I looked at the guy next to me and I said, they have awards for this stuff? Like, I didn't know anyone that did this. You know, and I, right. now I'm like taking this class on how to start a brewery. And, but the guy next to me said, oh yeah, no, you need to enter competitions because 
you're going to get feedback and they're like, mm-hmm. take it with a grain of salt, but you're going to get some really good advice from, from the right judges on what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong and how to fix it. And so that really helped me as well. So before I went commercial, I was definitely winning gold medals as a home brewer for beer, meads, and ciders. Okay. Yeah. I was about to ask that if you had um, competed in any big competitions. Uh, and I, I agree. I think that's super important. Um, it's funny you say that about friends. You can tell once you give enough brews to your friends when they, when they like, really like one. Um, I think you kind of read their face and when they, when they have that moment where they go, Oh my gosh, this is incredible. I cannot believe you made this. You're like, okay, that one was actually pretty good. Um, Cause yeah, free booze is free booze. And it, I guess it depends on who you're giving it to. Some of my friends are um, more knowledgeable of, of uh, you know, different kinds of alcohols. And so they can actually give feedback, but I definitely think the competition side is super important. Um, so you entered you did a bunch of meads and did you do mostly one category where you like when you started going deeper into mead world, did you decide to do more mead competitions or did you just continue to do more beers or what did you pursue? So once I went commercial and opened my business, I don't think maybe, but one time I home brewed a batch of beer after that. Okay. Now I started doing collaborations of breweries and, and brewing beer on big scale where which was really cool and you know you're just kind of extrapolating what you know from home brewing that was super fun it still is super fun for me Mm -hmm. to go to a brewery and do a collab and as far as meads and the styles go um i guess i got into the crazy stuff but also doing melomels and doing like sort of specific things ahead of time and then as i got into to my business i wanted to make products i wanted to drink first and foremost but also make things that would be you know popular in the market and so one of the things that I did really quick in, in the evolution of superstition is I saw that an organization was forming called the American Mead Makers Association. And so my wife and I became some of the first founding members of this organization. Eventually, I became a board member in a couple different roles and helped write legislation that was introduced to Congress. We're working with the SBA and the TTB to, like re- to try and make meat its own classification in the mm-hmm. Code of Federal Regulations. So we've been super involved we're trying to grow the industry. And along that path, for several years, I conducted uh, a survey of commercial meat makers and a corresponding national industry report. And it talked about the growth of the industry, the popularity of different mead styles, and, and several other things that we, we went through. And so for a few years, we were getting some pretty cool insight into how the industry was evolving. And without a doubt, the most popular style of meat is whatever form of a melomel. So yeah. people love fruit and honey together. I mean, honey goes with, I always say, honey goes with everything. I mean, mm-hmm. honey and mustard. I mean, honey <laughs> yeah. mustard. I mean, h- honey goes with everything. Honey nut Cheerios, it's in cereal. Mm-hmm. It's in, how many things can go with mustard and cereal, right? I mean, honey goes with everything. It goes with chocolate, mm-hmm. salt, like it's crazy. So anyways, um, as, as far as that goes, I was thinking like, okay, if melomels are number one, it makes sense to focus on putting fruit in, in meads. Now, of course, we should never forget what defines mead, and it's honey. Mm-hmm. So we take Arizona honey for everything that's in a bottle. When we use most of our cans, use an international honey, because I want to, as a company, have a product that's positioned in the marketplace like a double IPA for the price point. So our cans are about six bucks for a 16-ounce can, mm-hmm. similar sort of you know um, ABV. But... Everything that that is superstition in a bottle uses Arizona wildflower mesquite honey for the most part. Sometimes we can get some really cool, unique honey varietals from small local beekeepers. Uh, I like to focus on traditional mead making when we when we get those cool honeys to showcase the qualities of that varietal. But for the most part, as a business, we we do fruit meats. I mean, we do prickly pear fruit and all the different berries and things, and then we'll add different adjuncts and barrels to make that you know, really shine. And I think that, you know, our piments where we're using wine grapes from usually from California, but paired with that Arizona honey and all different kinds of barrels, we've done piments in every kind of American oak toast level you can imagine and European oak and rum barrels and scotch barrels and whiskey barrels and rum. It's so much fun. So I think that if you're looking at the market and and how we've evolved, we focus on the fruit thing, 
but we also do methaglins and we also now we're doing crazy session meads that are inspired by milkshake IPAs. And, mm. you know, I think it's important for me to, to be able to do a perfect traditional mead. Cause for me, that's kind of like the Pilsner of the brewing world. Like yeah. there's, yeah, I mean, obviously sweetness can hide some things, but if you do it right and you really showcase the varietal and there's nothing off, it's, it's a perfect representation of a mead. And when people ask me, what's the best mead for like a new consumer? I mean, my first answer is like our best selling mead, which is Marion. It's got three different berries in it. And, and it's great because it's the cool natural connection for the wine love, right? Cause it's mm -hmm. like, okay, I can kind of get these, these vinous notes, but what I really want to do, if it's just me hanging out with someone, I'm going to give them a traditional meat first and go, this is me. This is a traditional meat. And now let's talk about how it can turn into so many other amazing things. That's been one of my goals um, since I started I, uh, to, to master that traditional mead. And it's pretty tough. I mean, like you're saying, you can hide a lot of things with sweetness, but the, the true um, character that you want from a mead needs to come from not just the sweetness of, of a mead. And I think it's interesting, um, your honey type you guys use. I, I thought you guys would be, I didn't realize you, you were using as much mesquite blossom honey, which... I love mesquite blossom honey. That's one of my favorites up there with um, actually avocado blossom. For whatever reason, those two are just some of my favorites. So I, I do have a question about um, how many iterations of a mead recipe do you guys feel like you go through before you get the final one? I, obviously, we're constantly getting better and making different, different iterations. Are you making te test batches left and right? Or are you guys throwing caution to the wind and going for it or what are you doing? So when we, we do test batches constantly, we have so many things in play that when I go into our production facility, my staff will hand me something to sample. Mm. I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> Anyone that works for us that has an idea about a product they want to make gets to make a test batch of it. Mm. And I don't care what it costs, what the ingredients are. If it's legal, make it. And if it's That's not, cool. bring it to our Christmas party. So anyways, <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but but no, any, anything that we were allowed to use for, for ingredients, I, I support and, and, and I want to try. And I do that because I've been wrong before. Mm -hmm. And I've had staff come up with ideas that I did not like and said, okay, do it anyways. And I was totally blown away. Mm -hmm. So I'm not always, you know, my, my ideas, my intuition on what will be good isn't totally always on. And we all make things that we don't really dig. And if we do that, we'll adjust it in secondary or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So when we make a test batch, it depends on the size. And I think we've, we actually did like 700 gallons in something we'd never done before last year. That was crazy that turned into our first session meeting. It was, it was really, really well received. And we did backseat bingo with Wiley Roots as a collab. And you know, it was mm -hmm. this crazy milkshake IPA inspired thing for the first time. And, and I remember carrying these bags of lactose up a ladder thinking, how big is this batch? Like, this is nuts. So, so no, we, but, but all of what we do with R and D, all the new stuff, it's based on what we know has worked before in one way or another, whether it's the yeast or the ingredients and, and then kind of going back to what I used to do as a home brewer by taking a proven recipe and tweaking it. We'll take something that we know works. We've done it before. We know the temperature. We know how to manage this stuff. And fermentation but let's add something we've never done with a reasonable expectation that it's going to turn out well mm -hmm. and 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 we've i mean i i don't know we've i made like a perry once we didn't dig like four gallons we dumped and you know we've we've almost never had to actually dump something that we couldn't fix in our own way or yeah. put it on oak or throw it in a barrel or blend it with something so so yes we do crazy stuff all the time from five gallon one off still to single barrel batches to sometimes bigger things where I'm even like having reservations on the on like the business acumen here, but it works. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of how we, how we do that. I don't know if I answered your question, right? No, that's, that's great. And I, I asked that because as a home brewer, I think we're constantly trying to make that perfect recipe. Of course we go off other recipes, but um, one of mine, that I've been trying to tweak for a long time is a peppermint mead. And it's just like tons of candy canes and lots of honey and yeast and all those things. But I'm out on iteration five 
and trying to still perfect it. And so, again, I think that us home brewers are trying to um, see what commercial meteries are doing. And it's interesting that, like, I love that you get to open it up to your staff, that you just allow your staff to bring forth their ideas and uh, and their palettes and, and those things. I think that's incredible. Yeah, innovation has been a core aspect of our ethos at Superstition since we began. And it goes back to the spirit of homebrewing and making something cool and crazy that at least that's what I did. And, and as I got to know other homebrewers, I had friends that were like, I'm going to make the perfect version of this beer. And that's all I want to make. And that's totally cool. And I respect that. Some days I wish I made one or three things. Like I was just making Trappist Roche four, six, eight, and 10. That's all I ever did. And I would be like, dude, how many problems would be solved with that? It'd be amazing. Yeah. But that's just not how I'm wired. And I love coming up with new stuff, but we do minor uh, adjustments in our recipes as we move forwards with things that we've already introduced to the market. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it would make sense to do a radical adjustment because then you've created a new product. And if you do that, or you have a stuck fermentation or some, something crazy happens that's happened to us over the years, then you have a new product. So you make yeah. lemonade and worst case scenario, you need to, you know, get a cool new label designed and you sell something that's new to the market. But right. you know, we've, as we're doing new things, like thinking about our session meets right now and what you just said, we definitely have some ideas on how to adjust like, okay, let's bring down the sweetness a little next batch. Let's highlight the pineapple in this one or whatnot. So um, I think we're always looking to improve what we do. And as cer certainly with evolving things that aren't mm -hmm. really our core products to fine tune them. And then the other ongoing challenge that you face as a home brewer or as a commercial meat producer is to maintain the same quality and the mm -hmm. same profile and the same ABV and all of, that's a whole nother skill set is being able to build something that's a core product that your customers know it's going to taste the same every time I drink it. Yeah. Okay. So well, that's funny. One of my questions I, I had to ask you that I just wrote down probably five minutes before we started. Um, so Obviously, you have some things on your website, and I want to make sure and plug that if you want to find Superstition Meadery, go check them out. Look up Superstition Meadery, and you'll find their website. Order some mead on there. Um, there's a lot of options. Obviously, you, you're hearing now we have a lot of options, or they have a lot of options to choose from. I noticed on there you have, I think it was the uh, Aphrodisia. Does that seem right? I don't really Yes, yes. Aphrodisia. There's a batch 22. There's a batch 23. My question is, do you... Um, do you guys keep many multiple bottles of each batch and then side by side compare them ever and go, what was batch 20 like compared to batch 23? Is that something you guys ever do? hundred percent. We have something we call our reserve. And I used to save a whole case of every batch we ever made of anything and we didn't have room for it. And so at two staff parties ago, two summers ago, mm -hmm. we we're like, okay, we can't even unbox this stuff and put it on a shelf anymore. And so we decided to do an audit of our reserve and uh -huh. develop three categories. One was, it's getting worse. One was, it's not getting worse, but it's not getting better. And the other was, it's getting better or more unique in some way. And so we found that our products, sometimes with coffee or hops, we're either in that it's getting worse or it's not getting better scenario. Some products were in the getting worse quality uh, of category because our bottling line, the batch itself or whatever, just didn't lend itself to the best quality. Mm -hmm. Most things were sort of in that it's not getting worse, but it's not really getting better. It's aging really well, mm -hmm. no problem to hang on to it. But also that's not a reason to like, highlight that on a reserve, like a special seller list. And then we had things that were getting better or aging super well. Mm -hmm. And so what we found was things that are sweeter and things with higher ABV age much better than semi-sweet or dry meats, for example. And I think things that are in barrels tend to age better as well because you're going to have different tannins, alcohol resist oxidation, mm -hmm. you know, um, we're using, you know, sulfites as you would in winemaking to also help with aging. We're, we, we've improved the quality of our packaging lines and practices and closures over the years. And so 
what we're putting out today over the last couple of years is going to be probably better than what we did in the beginning with the exception of like the white series that we've done that are so sweet and, and 13 and a half percent ABV. When you hit that sweet spot of mm-hmm. sweetness and ABV, yeah. you're going to, you're going to probably be good, but that's kind of like the answer to our reserve program. And we're still setting aside cases of things we really like or that are brand new so that we can try them out and on on the note of aphrodisia it's a funny story so at the federal level if you're not in california don't quote me on this because i'm not an expert at all states but (laughs) there's a process called chaptalizing in winemaking and so like i grew up in maryland and you've probably never had a bold maryland cab Mm -hmm. right and one of the reasons why is, and I'm sure there's some good wines coming out of Maryland. And so I, I, I hope I'm not insulting anyone right now, but <laughs> one of the reasons is the weather. And so in some States, it doesn't get dry enough in the right time of year to get grapes to the right sweetness level, to have the right qualities, to make the right product that you're going for that would compare with the best of the best. Right. And so in some States, in some countries, people will add table sugar, for example, to a red wine. This is just one example to boost the ABV so that you have something that's now 14% product that otherwise would have been maybe 10 or 12. And, and so federally you're allowed to do that and you're allowed to add a certain amount of sugar to a grape varietal, not say it on the label and still say it's a Cabernet wine. Mm. If you put one drop of honey in that Cabernet, Mm. you're now not allowed to say where the honey came from or where the grapes came from or what grapes you even put in there. Why? They say the why answer is that you would be deceiving the customer Mm. when ironically you would be doing the exact opposite and educating them as to where the honey's from, what grapes you use, where the grapes are from. And so a lot of laws are written to specifically allow something to happen Mm -hmm. and other laws are written to protect something. Right. And so I think that that's sort of a combination. I think most of the wine laws that, that we follow as a meadery, they're really written to allow wineries that make great wine that clearly run the wine world to do certain things they want to do. And in some cases to prevent certain people who would be maybe that, that aren't like, like bead makers or whatever, but from acting in a way that would detract from the nobility or the reputation mm-hmm. of, of some of the things that the wine world has worked hard to establish. So, so I appreciate that. However, as a mead maker, I find it ridiculous right. that I can't tell you where the grapes come from in my pimates. And, you know, I'm allowed to, I think, tell my customers that come into my taste room, hey, this yeah. is what we use. You know, I'm probably not allowed to advertise that in certain ways, certainly can't say it on the label. And so what we do uh, as a business is there's some, like, there's some gray, but most of it's black and white when it comes to alcohol. There's pretty strict rules mm-hmm. and we follow the rules because there's no sense taking that risk, right? So at at the, you know, exchange of not having the label I want, I'd rather just keep making the awesome products that we do and tell folks, hey, if you have batch 22, it's a surprise, it's 23, it's a cap, we use these barrels. And that's one reason why Aphrodisia for us has so many different batch numbers because we change it batch to batch and that's mm-hmm. fun. And it's meant to be that way. That's our intention is to give you a new experience year in and year out. And our current batch 22 and 23 happened to be aged in barrels that were a mix of white series and former aphrodisia barrels mm-hmm. that were over two years old. It's the oldest age pimate we've ever released. Ah. They're incredible. And so anyways, but yeah, thanks for mentioning our website. And just for a second of a shameless plug, like yeah, if anyone's it. interested in some of what we're talking about, we can ship to 40 States in DC from our website. And we we're constant leases the best way to stay on top of what's coming out is to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. But we also have a guild and, and we just started our new guild membership signups this month. And if you join our guild and you live locally, you get certain benefits like 10% off anytime you come into our restaurants. But even if you don't live in Arizona or you do, and we can ship within Arizona as well, you get your own private web store and mm-hmm. you'll have access to our new releases, most of them an hour before anyone else does, which is kind of cool. And you get the membership, which is it's $375 to join this year. You'll get more than that in the retail value of the bottles that we'll send you. 
And for the first time ever, we're setting up our web store, our, our guild membership in concert with our web store so that we will, for that 375 pay, no matter where you are in those 40 states, to ship you a case of 12 bottles, six different things of meats that we've never made before. And, and so it, so there, and, and you won't get those till the fall, but along that way, you get your own web store, you get discounts and all this stuff. So, and there's more things. So you can check that out on our website. And if you're more of the like subscription wine club based sort of mindset, we've got an awesome mead club where through our web store, you just go to our website and sign up. If you're interested, you can get six or 12 bottles quarterly or monthly, and you never know what you're going to get. So it's kind of a grab bag, but everyone's been really happy because sometimes we'll even put bottles in there that are labeled and like ready to sell, but we haven't even released yet. And so there's a lot of fun surprises. So those are two really cool ways or just check out our, you know, our, our web store and, and you can get, you know, if you live in 80% of the country, you can order our stuff. Yeah. And I'll for sure be putting that down in the description of, of the podcast. If you're listening, um, you know, without the video and if you're watching the youtube video it's down in the description check them out and join all those things that's fantastic and if you want to get it seems like exclusive meads that are um well new i should say if you want to be the first one to a mead that that seems like the best way to do it so i have a couple home group home brew questions that i think uh will be interesting for us so first one we talked about mellow mels of course they're one of the biggest uh, mead styles that people achieve or want to go make. My question is when you guys are brewing most mellow mels, I guess it depends on which one. Do you prefer to put your fruit in the primary or do you guys like to put it in the secondary? What's your process look like with that? So most of the time we're going to ferment with fruit at some point in the fermentation. Sometimes we will go ahead and throw fruit even still into a barrel through a funnel and as far as sort of the recipes for it, it depends on what you're doing. And so when we make our piments and our sizers, there's no water at all. Ne we've never oh. done that unless, but I think with Electric Sunrise, we did a lower ABV piment and we put a little bit of water into that so the alcohol wouldn't be so high. Um, and there's some federal reasons for that too, with, we can talk about later if you want to get into the weeds on that <laughs> stuff. But um, we, we will put in fruit if you want to, in the case of berries, for example, or even like a juice that's not mm -hmm. whole fruit, if you put it in the end of fermentation, you're going to have more of that fruit flavor and aroma and color and quality than you will if you put it in the beginning as CO2, drive some of that out. But if you start with fruit juice and fermentation, like when we do our, our, our Ragnarok, it's half mango juice, half water from day one. And there's so much mango juice in there that you get mango and these awesome tropical flavors by the time you're done. And then there are other things where, you know, it just depends on the recipe. Um, sometimes like right before the end of fermentation, we'll transfer something into another fermenter for like a small batch and freeze peaches with liquid nitrogen and then put that in there. So we use fruit juices, fruit, fruit purees, whole fruit. We've done the liquid nitrogen thing, mm -hmm. you know, We've used our blenders to make our own puree from local citrus. We've picked fruit off of trees. Um, I mean, there's so many ways that we've, we've done that. I don't think we've ever heated any fruit yet, but with special ingredients, mm -hmm. we'll do that. You know, we'll get our, the old homebrew turkey burner out and, uh, and we'll put cacao nibs and almonds or yeah. whatever it is on there and, and do that. Uh, we also have a hot back that we don't really use for fruit so much, but it's an outstanding tool or not just hops, but vanilla beans and coffee to mm -hmm. circulate a mead through that. And when I used to throw vanilla beans in a barrel, not only do you have to clean that out and stuff and worry about like having like the little vanilla ice cream stuff everywhere, yeah. but you know, it works, worked great, worked for years, but it also took a couple months. Mm -hmm. And now we can put the same amount of vanilla beans in a hop back and clean everything, of course, and, and circulate a mead over a weekend and have a better vanilla flavor in three days. It's crazy. So as we've grown our economy of scale and we've gotten new equipment, we've been able to make mead um, in less time than before as well, yeah. which is really exciting. So when you say you're putting stuff in, you're mainly talking about putting fruit in right before the primary is ending, correct? You're not talking about actual legit secondary 
uh, you said some small batch stuff you guys will rack off and then technically it's secondary. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll, we will do that too. It just depends on the recipe. Mm -hmm. So um, in your experience, are there any, um, can you give, may, obviously there are a million fruits in the world. Can you give like some of the standard ones like apples and, and oranges and uh, let's see, what are some ones people like to use? Berries, cherries and mixed berries, stuff like that. Are, can you throw them into categories of um, better up front at the beginning of the fermentation or better, you know, at the end of fermentation? I'm going to hesitate to say better in some cases because I'll just tell you what we've done and, and work. So mm -hmm. like with our, our piments, I always had like, you know, there's a romantic idea that you're going to take honey and whole fruit and use a wine press every single time. And I get that. And we do that. And it is romantic and it is awesome. And it makes awesome products. It's not the only way to make stuff, but for our piments, that's how I've always done it. Mm -hmm. And we buy grape juice and we buy whole grapes and there are different reasons to do that as well. When you're using whole fruit, there's definitely an increased commitment of time and equipment mm -hmm. to that process. But depending on the fruit, uh, where it's grown and how you process it, you can have in, uh, results in the end that are maybe better with one way or better with the other or just awesome no matter what you do. And I like to use different techniques for the, uh, for the sake of the craft and the art, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we buy whole grapes and we wanted to like, we have like our first wine just came out and we're gonna do some mead variations on this soon, but we made an orange wine. And so orange wine it, from one perspective or definition is using citrus. We didn't use citrus. So when you make red wine, you're gonna ferment on the skins and you're gonna extract tannin and color and aromas that you otherwise wouldn't get if you just squeezed the grapes and, and, and fermented the juice. Right. So there are real reasons to use whole fruit. As a matter of fact, a lot of the champagne, if you drink French champagne, it's made with Pinot Noir, it's not mm -hmm. fermented on the skins. So they're making out of red grapes, which is kind of mind blowing when you think about all the like, you know, pale yellow champagnes that you've drank over the mm -hmm. years. But when you make a, an orange wine, you ferment white wine grapes using that red wine tactic of fermenting on the skins and the resulting color looks orange because yeah. that's what those kind of green white grapes turn into. And so we're doing orange wine piments. We're even coming out with piment piquettes. And so a piquette is a style of winemaking where you ferment wine grapes on the skins and then you rehydrate the skins with some water after you've pressed out all the wine and you get a little more flavor color and now sugar's back in and we're adding in honey with that and we're doing that with an orange wine style even to do an orange wine piquette, probably the first of its kind in the world. Yeah. So, huh. so when you're talking about which fruits are good in the beginning or the end, I think they all can work. And like we're, we're doing a, um, a blueberry mead, for example, that we made with honey and blueberries. We put it in a barrel that came out of McKellar, San Diego from this blueberry oat wine we did in 2017. And now it's with this blueberry wine, it was 38 months in the barrel. And we had two identical yeah. barrels, or so I thought. One was mind-blowing. It was like a blueberry tawny port. I'm like, we've got to bottle this as is. It's called the Horned One. It'll be coming out in January. It's got this cool kind of black metal dude, but he's carrying blueberries. And then the other one, it just didn't taste as good. I'm like, well, what can we do? And we started messing around with some of our, our wine that we had. And mm -hmm. so we blended that blueberry melamel with some Syrah wine that was still fermenting. And now we have something incredibly new we've never made before. There's only gonna be like 50 gallons of it. It's only gonna go into kegs. And that came into play towards the end, but as a blend. So, I mean, there's so many ways you can do things. Yeah. And I think it's fun to experiment, take what you know works. And when you have something, like in the case of the one barrel that just didn't meet our expectations, wasn't as good as the sister barrel, let's add something else that's going on that we have access to. And I think that that's one of the things we've excelled at at Superstition is never accept, I mean, within, you know, there's some exceptions, but pretty much never accepting that, okay, this is done. We can't fix it. There's nothing else that can be done. I like to think that we adapt so well to what we're doing and evaluate things along the way and make changes as need be, whether it means throwing in some more fruit. And, and again, yes, we've done the secondary thing plenty of times. It works great. Mm -hmm. I think that as a general rule, 
the less water that you put into a melomel, the better it's going to be if you are doing the fruit all in the beginning or mostly in the beginning. And if you're going to do something with honey water and yeast and add fruit later, that's fine. And that way you're going to want to put it more in the end or in secondary, mm-hmm. because then you're going to retain the color and the flavor and the aroma that you're going. For. Yeah. Well, and that's a big thing. Um, one of my things I love doing about or with mead is side by side testing things A and B. And so I've done tests on, you know, apples in the primary versus secondary identical meads, all those things. So uh, I just thought that was, I wanted to know from a, a, a um, successful commercial meadery kind of what you guys do. So I have a question about um, yeast. Now I'm not going to ask you recipes. I'm not going to ask you specific yeast, you know, strains. Do you guys use um, the same yeast pretty consistently or do you guys try to vary it up? We have what we call our house yeast. And at this point it is proprietary and it's banked for us at white labs and I would advise anyone getting into mead to look at for traditional meads and for things that are, it sounds almost stupid to say it, but sort of on the lighter color spectrum, because Mm -hmm. a lot of the fruits that go into that category, whether it's citrus or apples benefit from this is looking at white wine style yeasts. Mm -hmm. And then we use like a red wine style yeast for our piments and, and our, our darker fruits that seems to have worked out for us over the years. But we also have a real high gravity yeast that we will co-pitch when we're doing high gravity fermentations. For us, Mm -hmm. it's over about 14% for our definition. We use a different yeast for our session meads. We use a different yeast for our ciders. We use ale yeast. We co-ferment with ale yeast and wine yeast sometimes. Interesting. So we do a lot of different things. When you co-ferment, are you starting with the ale yeast since generally they're going to get overrun by wine yeast? How do you do that? We'll pitch them together. And I've even done that at breweries with collabs for high gravity braggots that we've brewed. And sometimes they'll decide. And I like when you're the guest, you know, you're like, yeah, we'll come up with an idea. But if they got an idea how they want it to go, that's cool. I'm happy to be there. Right. And so we've done it both ways where they'll co-pitch in the beginning or they'll add in our, our wine yeast after the ale yeast gets a chance to get started so that they can try and get some of those phenols and esters out of a Belgian or Hefeweizen yeast or whatever their goal is. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, we've done it in, like in all those different ways. And all those ways work. I think that if like we used a, a whip bread ale yeast for our mugwort piment, which was the first collaboration between two meteries that had ever happened with our friends from Mabinogi and Wales, they brought us Welsh mugwort and this British whip bread ale yeast. And we used organic Arizona uh, apple cider from the only commercial cider press in the state. And we used Arizona honey. And we just co-pitched them together. And you definitely got some of that like bready quality from that, from that yeast that they brought to the ale yeast. And then you, it was what most of the yeast that we use ferments what I would call very cleanly. And when you're brewing beer, for example, sometimes a pretty high percentage of the flavor you get comes from the yeast you choose and the temperature it ferments at. And that can certainly be true for meat and wine, but I want to accentuate the flavor of the honey that we're using or the special ingredients or the barrel more than relying on the yeast. And, the, and, the, and of course, we have to have the right temperature and all that stuff to, to get, achieve these goals. But my goal is generally to have a complementary yeast flavor profile, but is rather neutral as far as what it contributes to the end product. Yeah, interesting. Um, I, I've... Uh... I've used some white lab stuff. I've, I use a lot of Lalvin. I use a lot of red star, you know, I feel like those are not necessarily easier to get, but I get a little sketched out. Not that white labs and, and, you know, Omega do don't do well, but shipping yeast, the risk of what if it goes bad in, in shipping. And so I end up using a lot of dry yeast and rehydrating, but um, I, I do like your, your phrase that your, your yeast, well, you're basically saying the yeast shouldn't be the primary character and highlight, it should be a, highlighting the honey character. That's just what I do. That's just what we do. Like, it's not the only way to do it. I think that it's, we've never turned away from a technique or an ingredient without, like, I, I don't want to judge things without giving them a shot and seeing if they work for me, if I can make them work. And I think it's really important to make traditional meats and to use whole fruit and to to do things that are 
really representative of the craft in the, in the most romantic sense. I love that. That's often what makes me the most excited when we're like going through the, the crazy hassle of cooking honey to make a boche or something, for example. Yeah. I, I love those days. But at the same time, if there's a new ingredient that you want to try, like I would advise people, that's just what's worked for me, to give it a shot. Even if it's just a bench trial where you take a glass of mead you made and you put some weird thing in there and see what it tastes like. And I, I couldn't imagine not doing a business of any kind without being innovative and coming up with new stuff. It helps keep me motivated. It keeps your staff motivated. Mm-hmm. It keeps customers engaged with what you're doing. And it shows that you couldn't care more about what it is you're producing, you know? Absolutely. Um, okay, so... My next question, you with yeast, you have, you know, obviously you're, you're using um, your house strain, which I, I could go down a rabbit hole with that, but I'm going to divert because <laughs> I have a lot of questions. Maybe I'll, I'll email you. But do you guys use many um, other, I call them white powders, lots of people do, things like uh, acid blends, or do you guys use any anything for building body? Are, are you pretty, or, or are you pretty much... Um, doing that with barrels and tannic values from that are you guys using yeah yeah we just started looking at some tannins that you put in fermentation to get some some additional color and flavor out of fruit um i think that all of those natural materials that are available to the mead maker are Mm -hmm. worth exploring and we definitely do in different ways um i mean it's important to manage your fermentation and you know do all the things that we know these days that you need to do to have a clean product in the end. I think that, um, so yeah, the answer is yes, but, but our focus really is on the ingredients in the barrels. And that's the sort of talk that comes out of our production meetings every Tuesday afternoon is we've got this idea, how are we going to achieve these goals? And I know that that's where we focus and that's what's worked for us for sure. And do you guys use um, much yeast nutrient? Do you, what do oh, you front absolutely. Load with generally? Or do you front load? Do you guys like to stagger? What do you like to do? For the most part, we will, we'll, we'll, if we're, if we are going to use dry yeast and, and we exclusively use dry yeast for, for years, uh, rehydrating your yeast at the right temperature, following directions is really important. I remember <laughs> a couple of times I didn't like with fining and stuff. And I was like, why didn't this work? And then I went back and read the direction. It's like, Oh, I probably had too many beers when I was doing that. So, um, so yes, I mean, rehydrating your yeast is important. Yeast nutrients are important. You know, all the different things from like Scott Labs and the Fermatos and K's of the world are awesome. And for the most part, when yeast is beginning the, the, the life cycle where it's growing in acrospore to bud, it's scrubbing oxygen from the wort or from the must. And that's when your yeast wants oxygen. And so we use food grade oxygen diffused through a giant O2 stone in a tank And so we're going to actually add that food grade oxygen for about the first third of fermentation. And we're going to add nutrients for about the first half. And then there are some other things you can use different nutrients that are, uh, that are meant for the end of fermentation. And then it's important to, to rack off of primary as soon as fermentation's done to avoid any of the potential off flavors coming out of the autolysis process of the yeast Mm -hmm. that are dying and the, and the cell membranes are rupturing. So Mm-hmm. So that's really important. Uh, yeah. And if you're going to find something, you know, whether it's bentonite or icing glass or whatnot that you're using as a home brewer, um, again, just follow the directions with the temperatures and the amounts and everything, and then rack off of that as well, um, you know, when you can. And then one thing I think that that's, that's important is, is we use uh, lenticular filters uh, for us uh, with different size filter media. So sometimes mm-hmm. we'll go through, you know, two different sizes in line. Sometimes we'll filter once and go, all right, let's evaluate this. All right, let's filter it again, same or smaller. Um, but as a home brewer, I remember always reading that, well, now filtration can really strip out the flavors and, and take away what you're doing. That can be true. I've seen it at the commercial level in a couple of instances, but for the most part, one, one term that winemakers use is polishing with filtering. And you can actually kind of make it better. Mm-hmm. So don't be afraid, again, following instructions and everything to get into like a Buen Vino plate and frame filter. That really helped the quality of what I was doing um, commercially back when for me commercially meant extreme homebrewing for years. Right. <laughs> so, so I think that um, filtering is also important. And 
and not and now we're doing intentionally unfiltered products mm -hmm. in cans and in bottles coming out early next year and there's a lot of reasons behind that but for the most part i think as a commercial mead maker if you're walking down the aisle of a liquor store in minnesota or in france and you see a bottle of superstition and you're like all right the label's kind of cool the bottle's kind of cool but you don't know what mead is you don't know about our company and and you're engaged with that label enough to go and look at it and maybe pick up that bottle and read it i think it better be clear because if you don't know what it is and there's funky stuff floating in it which used to happen with my early examples a lot <laughs> when they hit a chiller at whole foods or something like that does that's not your best foot forwards in the minds of most people right and if you're doing something that's not clear, it should be hazy or unclear, unfiltered, I yeah. think intentionally, and probably communicate that on the label in some way. So someone's like, all right, I get it. It's supposed to be this way. And maybe it's going to make it taste better and feel better anyway. So yeah, no, I agree. And I think the um, it, it, as a, well, let me back up. So you talked about your, the, um, I don't know how many microns you're going down to, have you ever noticed the myth that people, lots of people, lots of people say is that it pulls out tannins, like because of the particles, have you ever noticed any difference of a, the tannic value between a filtered mead and an unfiltered mead? I'm sure that's possible, but nothing I can think of right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I honestly have no experience of a B testing that, but um, yeah, I, I think it, I think it kind of, if anything, would it help? I think filtration can help integrate flavors mm -hmm. earlier on than they would on their own. And maybe that's, maybe that's a way to explain it. And, and maybe if you feel like, okay, I had this super tannic thing and I ran it through a filter and now it's less tannic. I think that you're probably knocking off some of the big edges of those tannins and helping it integrate with what's left over. Probably again, polishing or improving the overall mouthfeel and flavor and aroma and, and getting it more towards what you want the customer or your friend at your house to, to mm -hmm. enjoy when you're serving it to them. Yeah. Well, now that, that was my only um, question, you know, obviously I'm all about uh, trying to be clear. I mean, I have tons of stuff behind me that's not clear at all, but I, I do like the finding agents and there's a big, um, I think demographic of mead makers who are very anti bentonite, anything that could be of, a powder, I should say. So that filtration system is is obviously a great remedy for that. If you are somebody who doesn't want to use sparkloid or any of that stuff, um, there's a lot there's a lot of ways to homebrew. I feel like, and we're all just kind of fighting to be right. <laughs> but you know, I I think that even just cold crashing is a great way to clear something up too. I mean, mm -hmm. we didn't talk about that. So. If you have the ability, you know, like you're lucky enough to have your own fridge, your wife lets you have in the garage <laughs> and you can stick a carboy in there, a bucket, like that's pretty cool. So I think that like, that's definitely something to note, but it's also important to note that it, it, there's no right or wrong way to do anything. I mean, do make meat and drink meat however you want. I fully support it. I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to be psyched if you tell me, Hey, I did this wild fermentation of a natural wine with grapes. I grew myself. I, I will be the first one in line to try it. And the natural wine thing is really starting to take off mm -hmm. in the wine world. But there are also reasons why you will never see those practices at a huge commercial scale because yeah. there are risks involved that you cannot take when your company is a certain size unless you're doing really small batch stuff. So I think that, like I said, we use so many different techniques and some are more risky than others, mm -hmm. whether it's a financial risk or a risk to the product taste in the way you want or whatever. So I think that at the homebrew level, do whatever you want to do. That's awesome. And at the commercial level. And, you know, one day I would love to do, we have a, a couple of demijohns, you know, in our tasting room with some mm -hmm. wild yeast in there and uh, some Rosalaire cultures and stuff that it hasn't tasted the way we want yet. So we haven't <laughs> packaged it, but, um, I'm sure you'll see a couple of real funky things come out from us. It will never touch the equipment in my commercial production facility the yeah. way everything else does. So I'm totally like hyper vigilant on that. Like when we do collabs with breweries and you never want to like be insulting and be like, well, is there any chance that your barrels were around like the wild barrels? And, <laughs> and if there is, I respect that a lot of people, probably most are able to keep everything clean, separate, never have a problem. But I know too many people that have had those, 
you know, mm -hmm. infections cross over into the stuff they didn't want to have that flavor profile. Mm -hmm. And so we're as aware as we can be and as careful as we can be as a commercial meadery to not do, um, you know, the wild funky stuff in our facility, but that doesn't mean I don't like it. And one day I would love to have another building where we could do that sort of stuff and crazy experiments and do, you know, real open fermentation, wild meads, especially pimates. I think that the flavor profile that some of the wild uh, wines I've had, natural wines, would really go great with pimates. Have you, when you were uh, homebrewing more, I don't know if you homebrew now, but when you were in the peak of your homebrewing season, I guess, were you ever trying wild yeast? fermentations or did you stick absolutely i won more medals for homebrew beers for my my flanders browns and anything else i ever made now, and how'd you i get the wild yeast from that what was your I just left the lid off a bucket in my house <laughs> there you go yeah well, uh, i also used to culture yeast from belgian beer bottles you know yeah and that was a lot of fun interesting did you ever have any go south after doing that um i've had some weird stuff happen yeah i still yeah. drank it though <laughs> oh yeah homebrew that's it no matter what what the product ends up being like yeah um man that's that's fascinating I, I love uh i love that you guys are able to experiment still i think that's one big thing that i hear from people who have started meteries is that they get stuck in a, a niche three or four types of meads and then they don't get to experiment and then, then you get this burnout of if you have the desire to, um, I can't experiment. I can't do more because it's too risky, but I love that you guys are opening those doors and saying, Hey, bring it on. Let's see what you got. Um, and obviously still creating incredible products in your mainland and then just opening up the flood. We maintain four core meads and bottles. They all happen to be seven fifties, which is kind of funny. One core cider, blueberry spaceship box in a seven fifty. I, we're going to attempt to have two core meads and cans next year that we don't run out of. But four weeks ago for the grand opening of our new uh, restaurant in Phoenix, we came out with nine brand new meads and bottles we'd never packaged before in one day, three in cakes. I think we're doing six to eight this month. We've got a couple slated for January. I think there's seven new meads already lined up for February. Like, That's awesome. It's like one or two a week. It's mm -hmm. crazy. And we'll go a couple of weeks where we just, oh, there's nothing new. And all of a sudden it's nine. It's yeah. insane, man. Yeah. And the amount of space and time that you need to dedicate to pull that off is uh, considerable. Uh, I think we're up to 300 different products on Untap right now that we've made in eight and a half years. That is so, insane. That's awesome. Again, I just couldn't imagine not doing what's again still basically extreme home brewing and i mean <laughs> i'll put out a five gallon keg for you know like our best account in arizona for example that's doing an anniversary party or something uh -huh. and just for the heck of it invite them up to make it with us or whatever and mm -hmm. um yeah I, I i don't i can't ever see stopping doing that i can see that we're going to grow our core program and mm -hmm. we're going to get that out to more people all the time we're getting bigger tanks we just had three thousand eight hundred gallon tanks delivered the other day Oh my gosh. Which is crazy. So that's going to be for our cider and our session meads. Wow. They're not even hooked up yet. They're still wrapped up in plastic. But I mean, we went from, you know, our 53 gallon barrels and even, you know, five gallon batches, which we still do sometimes mm -hmm. to now we're looking at, you know, 3,800 gallon batches that's of insane. cider coming out next year. Man. Do you guys ever do for anybody that might be local there? Do you guys do tours of any sort for your facilities or do you guys close it down pretty well? So if you join our guild, well, pre-COVID, we would do our guild gathering with like mm -hmm. a private tour for our guild. And then again, pre-2020 and soon, I hope next year, yeah. we'll do Barry White Day again, where we do a tour for anyone that wants to come out. But usually it's only two days a year. And it's not because we don't like showing people our stuff. It's because you can't walk through our building. <laughs> yeah. It's insane. I bet we it's need a new building correct. in the worst of ways. We have four 45 foot chippy containers that are filled. We've got uh, construction plans that should be, com they should have been complete, but should be complete by the end of the year to build a new building right across the street from us. That'll be an unlicensed warehouse, unlicensed meaning that we're only going to put product in there that's already packaged. We mm -hmm. paid our taxes on. So it'll basically be a storage place with some offices, but we need that because when you go commercial, you, people will tell you this and you won't believe them. 
because you're thinking tanks, you're thinking barrels, and they'll be like, okay, but where are you going to put your bottles and your cans and your kegs before they're filled and then after they're filled? And that storage amount, that requirement is crazy. So we are outsourcing cold storage to uh, a warehouse in it's a, a, a place in Phoenix and all the course licensing and all is in place to make this happen for anything going to our tasting rooms in Arizona or out of state or out of the country. And now we have, we're, we just signed a contract with Hensley Beverage Company, which is the biggest beer distributor in the state. And so we have places to send our products, uh -huh. but it's, it's crazy what, what you wind up learning and sort of troubleshooting as you're just figuring out the space concerns mm -hmm. of, of growing a business. And I think that's, well, that's, that's good news for people who are interested in, in wanting to start a meadery. I think that that's a very, um, a noble thing to want to do. I would love to one day be able to do that, but knowing the realistic side of what am I going to need, but beyond a license, beyond recipes, what physical places am I going to need and equipment, um, can be daunting, but obviously doable. And it, it takes time and, and you guys are growing at a rate that's it's awesome. You guys are doing amazing things. And uh, I, I want to make sure and highlight anyone who's listening to go check out Superstition's website and just peruse and, and buy some mead. Um, one of my big things I, I always say within this podcast and through my channel is that commercial meads are just as important as homebrew meads because every home brewer most of the time wants to do something more, wants to do something bigger. And you'd hope if you were to go bigger, that people would buy your mead still. So we're, we need to support each other and support the uh, commercial meads around us. And Jeff, I know that you have, you have quite a bit to do and you said you had a party to go to, so I don't want to take up all your time, but um, I, I've, this has been a blast and I, I hope that I can do this again. I can steal some of your time one day again and, and, and ask you more questions. I'm sure that after this podcast, I'm going to have a, um, a slew of questions from people uh, who want to know things from you. So thank you so much for your time. I hope that you, uh, I hope you, I, well, I'll say this. I can't wait to try more of your stuff. The, what you've described today has been fascinating and it's just so exciting. Cool. Hey, congrats on your podcast and, and, and getting people introduced to me as, as, a, as a whole is, is something I've been passionate about from the beginning. And it's so exciting to see where meat's going because I think we're really on this precipice of me becoming mainstream and not in it. Like, I don't, if you're a homebrew, you might hear that and think, Oh, well that's going to like ruin the creativity or really like, kind of like we hit on, it's going to open up doors, man, that none of us have seen. Right. It's, it's the opportunities that are going to come from me becoming more aware. It's going to create so much more meat out there. So much more good meat, so many cool creative things and collaborations and we're so far away from a day where we're like going to be bored with what's happening in mead that I'm so excited about where we are right now. It's really about to change in the next couple of years. I can feel the excitement in the market. And if uh, anyone listening is in the commercial mead world and we've gotten through 2020 together, man, <laughs> soon there's going to be a vaccine. We're going to go to festivals again. It's going to be awesome. And I think, you know, we should have this conversation again in you know, six months, 12 months and see where we're at. Cause I can't even tell you what my job will be in a year. It's, right. It's fast. Well, I have no doubt that within six months to a year, you're still going to be creating great stuff. And um, I want to highlight, I know that obviously we have your website and I'm going to push that. There's also a really cool um, video I'm looking at uh, by Paragraphic, and I'll put it down in the description as well. That was, if people want to see a little bit inside of your your zone, that they came in and, and did an awesome um, uh, interview slash just, informational thing about superstition and uh, i'll put that down there but man jeff this has been so much fun again i would love to do this again as, sooner than later but you know if it happens in a year and we just catch up and see where we're at uh this has been a blast cool nice to meet you and, and it was great speaking to, to all your listeners so thank Absolutely. you very much and I, I guarantee you, we're going to have, you're going to have lots of questions and, um, and I'm thankful for your passion as well. Obviously we need people who are passionate about mead for it to grow. And that goes not only for us as people who are producing a, a virtual product or a physical product, but as just consumers to talk about mead. Cause a lot of people will say, what is mead? Or, you know, you say the word and they think of that Bud Light commercial from the Super Bowl. Um, 
whatever that was two years ago where they made fun of mead makers uh that that's where they know mead so we got to get the word out in a positive light so cool all right man thanks appreciate your time all right